I'd like to turn green. I hope I'm on. If you can't hear me, please wave your hand. So uh, thank you first to, to all the guys at NCAR for in, inviting me to be here. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I've been collaborating with uh, NCAR for, for many years, so it's, it's, uh, it's great to give a talk. And I'm basically, I'm an observationalist. My job is to build climate data sets to take historical observations and turn them into great products. And as an observationalist, I'm keen basically on all different varieties of observations. We need all sorts of observations to uh, build our understanding of climate, but I don't love them all equally. I'm keenest really on ships. And the ship data has been the core really of the collaboration that I at least have worked on between the Met Office in the UK where I work and you guys here at NCAR. And I thought I'd begin just by showing you one of those key data sets. This is the ICOADS data set, the International Comprehensive Ocean Atmosphere data set. So every yellow dot is a weather observation. These are all from ships collected over time. This data set goes all the way back to about the 1690s with uh, uh, instrumental data, and it runs forward into the present. And I show you this not just because it you know, makes cool videos, it's rather interesting, it also matters. Right? ICOADS, I believe, is the single most important climate data set. Right? The thing we can't live without is information on the, the ocean surface weather. Right? And most of you probably haven't looked at ICOADS very often. Most people don't go into ship data very often. So I thought I'd show you exactly the same data in a slightly different form. So ICOADS, to a large extent, is the NCAR half of the collaboration. The, the, uh, the, the raw observations are very much kept here. This is the Met Office half of the collaboration. This is the HADIST data set. Hadley Center Sea Ice and SST data set. Right? This is HADIS 2.1, put together by my colleague John Kennedy. Right? And this gives monthly sea surface temperatures and sea ice coverages all the way back now to about 1850. Right? If you're a modeler, if you're an atmospheric modeler, this pretty much is your lower boundary condition. You'll use either HADIST or some very similar product. If you're an ocean modeler, this is your upper boundary condition. Right? This data set matters, it impacts to people. But it's important to remember this is exactly the same data set as the previous one I showed you. All this information comes from the ships. And I, a strong admirer of John Kennedy and Nick Rayner and all their work for taking that sparse collection of ship observations and making such a beautiful uh, result out of it. But it's important to remember that quite a lot of this is, is very uncertain. This is statistical reconstruction based on the ship data. But in fact, the original observations are even more important than that. So if you're an observationalist, you'll know about ICOADS. If you're a modeler, you'll know about HADIST. Right? If you're into impacts or political, um, uh, or political work or policy relevant information, you might be keener on things like the global temperature trend. So even those who haven't seen HADIST before, I hope this graph is not new to anybody. And to be fair, this graph is only 70% ICOADS because this is global mean surface temperature, and the ocean is 70% of the world. But it's still fundamentally the same data set. Those original raw observations are what makes this particular time series. So it turns out that actually those raw observations are really important. They feed into a lot of what we do with climate science. And they might actually be more important even than you might think just looking at the global temperature series. Because obviously, really, we're interested about future temperature, about trends and projections into the future. Right? But those also depend critically on our current day observations. So I'm still here talking about global mean surface temperature, or you know, large scale mean surface temperature. But here I'm showing you 1,100 years of temperature. So the little black trace around about the present day, that's had crew T. That's the global mean data set that I just showed you. But we also have a reconstruction going back a 1,000 years into the past. And those are proxy reconstructions based mostly on observations like tree rings and ice cores. Right? And we also have some projections going into the future. And those, of course, are entirely model-based projections. Right? And this really is why climate change is so scary. You know, We have very strong evidence nowadays that the future is going to be nothing like anything we've seen basically in the history of civilization. But if you ask, how do we know this? OK, the past reconstruction is based on tree rings. That's a proxy reconstruction. But those tree ring reconstructions are calibrated to the observational record. So essentially, when you build your reconstruction of the past, if you want to get a temperature out of a tree ring, 
you need to work out the relationship between tree ring width and temperature, and we do that by statistical comparison to that black curve, the instrumental record. Our projections of the future are obviously model-based, but those models are developed, right, tuned and tested against the observational record. So that little black line, the global temperature reconstruction, is fundamental to this entire time series. Without the observations, we'd still know that it's going to be warm in the future, and that the temperature in the past has been fairly stable, but our uncertainties would be much larger. We'd have much less confidence in the result. So we started from ships. We're going forward to our fundamental climate result, and that relationship is very strong and very important. So I worked when I started quite strongly on the global mean temperature record, but I gave it up quite a few years ago because it's a bit boring, really. Right? This is a really important result, but also it's a very well-known one. Right? And particularly from the observational perspective, from the black line here, that curve is not going to change very much. There's still work to be done on improving it, that work's still well worth doing. It's unlikely to make a really big change in the world. But also, this is the global mean temperature. Nobody lives in the global mean, right? We're really interested in what will happen locally, both in time and in space. And we're particularly interested in extreme events, you know? Not how will the global mean temperature change, but how will storms, droughts, the sort of severe weather that impacts us and our lives, how will that all change? And that also is something that we can try and reconstruct. And our reconstruction depends, once again, fundamentally on the original observational record on archives. So here's a reconstruction, hour by hour weather, for the year 1916. This is from the 20th century reanalysis. This particular one is version 2C. Right? And essentially, what we're doing here is we're reconstructing the weather of the world in exactly the same way that we'd make a weather forecast. We take a physical model that describes the atmospheric dynamics. We constrain that physical model with the observations. And here you can see the temperature. Blue areas are cold. Red ones are warm. The little vectors give you the wind. If you've got really good eyesight, you can see uh, pressure contours. More realistically, the, the, the black shading shows lines of precipitation. So this system is potentially powerful enough to give us our hour by hour weather reconstructions and our extremes, even 100 years ago and further back. But what I'm showing you here is not just the weather reconstruction. I'm also showing the set of observations that reconstruction is based on. You'll be familiar with the little yellow dots. Every yellow dot, one observation, in this case of surface pressure. And I've also added a load of gray shading, gray fog. So I like to call this the fog of ignorance. And it marks the areas where our reconstruction isn't very good. Right? Areas where there are fog, the supercomputer threw up its hands and said, no, sorry. There are too many solutions to the atmospheric equations of motion. We need more constraints. Give us more observations. So I like this video particularly because it tells, the, tells people really clearly what it is that I do. Right? My job is fog removal. Right? I look at things like this and say, this yucky gray stuff is unacceptable. We are going to scrub it off this picture and get better reconstructions of the underlying weather. And you can also see from this video how to do that. We need more yellow dots. We need more observations. So the job is conceptually quite simple. We're going to run an observations campaign. We're going to go back to 1916 and recruit some ships and put a barometer and thermometer on each ship and send them out to places like the Pacific, right? collect the observations, bring them back to the present day, put them in a new version of the reanalysis, build a better reconstruction. Nothing to it. First thing we need is a time machine. Right? As an Englishman, I know about time machines. They look like blue telephone boxes. And they make groaning noises. Right? In practice, they turn out not to look quite like that. Now, this building is not going to rival the Mesolab for architectural brilliance. But I like it nonetheless, because this is a time machine. Right? It's not the most beautiful of them. It's the one that's closest to the Met Office, where I work. This is Great Moor House. Right? And in this building, there are quite a few different things. But critically, there are also the UK National Meteorological Archives. And if you want to reconstruct the weather of 100 years ago or 200 years ago, archives and libraries are your friends. We go into buildings like this one and say, right, what have you got? Who was making weather observations back in 1916? And they'll come out with a pile of pieces of paper, 
big enough to surprise you. There's a lot of information out there. We're not using very much of it. So actually, the observational campaign I described, where you go back to 1916 and you recruit more ships, is actually possible because the observations were made. We're just not using them. And obviously, this is very much not a one-man show. There is a whole community of people devoted to time machine work, to the observations recovery. We call ourselves ACRE, Atmospheric Circulation Reconstructions Over the Earth. And it's a, it's a program led by my colleague Rob Allen at the Met Office. Right? And he's a very persuasive character, so he's recruited people from all over the world to participate in this game. Like most international collaborations, we don't have any money. We operate principally on sort of charm and persuasion and uh, indication of the importance of the work. But there are now little projects where people are saying, right, come on, we need to improve the reanalyses. We need more observations. Let's get out there and do some work on the subject. And we're running little sub-projects all over the world. So how about an example? some observations that have been recently rescued. We went into an archive, we dug out some more observations, we've turned them into, uh, into uh, uh, data that we can use, right? and we can start doing the comparison. So this is a set of observations we recently rescued. The time machine for these observations is in Oslo. Right? Okay. So audience participation section. What's this vessel? This data from 1947. Well done, sir. These data are from the Contiki, right? Technically speaking, this isn't actually a ship, right? We like to collect metadata on how the observations were made. I don't know how the sea temperature observations were made. We don't have the metadata. But it's about the only occasion that we have in the database where I held the thermometer and stuck it into the ocean. It's a plausible way of actually making the measurement, right? Six of them went across the ocean, right? One of them's job was to make weather observations. And if you look on the right, you can see a very, very characteristic, classic example of time machine output. This is the meteorological log of the Contiki. It's a bit minimalist, right? But essentially, most log books look like this. This is one day's data, midnight at the top, midnight at the bottom, noon in the middle. As you go down in time, every row is a separate point in time, usually an hour. Every now and then, they make a weather observation, and you can see them noted in the log. So they made observations twice a day as they sailed across the Pacific, right? And my colleague Sally Wilkinson went into the uh, Contiki Museum in Oslo and said, please, can we have the logbook? I took photographs and digitized the data and um, uh, rescued them. And we've converted them, excuse me, into observations. Always press the right button. There we go. We've converted them into observations. We haven't yet assimilated them into the 20th century of analysis, which is fine, because this means I can use them for validation. Right? Is the 20th century of analysis doing the right thing? So this little video just shows the raft sailing across the Pacific quite slowly. Right? And we're getting at the top the pressure, air temperature, sea surface temperature, wind direction, and wind speed. Those are the black dots, as observed by the crew of the raft. Right? And the blue dots are the 20th century reanalysis version 3. Right? It's an ensemble reanalysis. It makes 80 estimates of the weather at every point in time. So every black dot has 80 blue dots to compare it to. And I'm happy to tell you that 20CR version 3 is pretty good, which we knew already. Laura will be happy to hear that. Right? And it turns out that actually this, this reconstruction is very good. Of course, next time we run the reanalysis, we'll add these observations in. We'll put them into ICOADS. We'll assimilate them into the 20CR. And it will be even better. But even as it is, uh, we're uh, making you know, good headway with it. So this is the sort of thing we do. Right? And that's a couple of thousand new observations well worth having. Right? If you're curious about it, we've done quite a lot of this work, little projects, going into archives, extracting information from particular ships. We're particularly keen on voyages of exploration. We've got James Cook's observations. We've got the, some of the Northwest Passage expeditions. And if you go to this website, you'll see all that original data, the process of processing it, processing it into observations, using it in our, into our cards, a little bit of comparison. This is great. right? But the new data set I showed you has um, about two or 3,000 new observations in it. Right? And last time I looked, the 20th century reanalysis assimilated 1.6 billion observations. And if you go into the archives and say, well, 
how much information is there in the archives that we haven't rescued, that we could add? How many extra observations are potentially out there? That number is at least in the hundreds of millions. Right. So whilst rescuing 2,000 observations from the Contiki is great, cool little project, does make life better, we need to think bigger than that. Right. We need to think tens of thousands of ships, tens or hundreds of millions of observations. We need to build a whole process for extracting new data and running it through, and that process needs to operate at a big scale. So I'm particularly grateful at this point to the, to the uh, European Union and the Copernicus Climate Change Program, because when we explained this to them, they said, OK, we need to start building systems to actually enable this to happen. Right? And this is a schematic picture of the work that quite a lot of researchers are doing under the auspices of the Copernicus Climate Change Service Data Rescue Program, right? and that we start on the bottom left with our time machine outputs, photographs of the documents kept in the archives and libraries. We end up on the top right with new climate services, new climate products, and we're building an infrastructure to move from one to the other to try and move away from individual scientists running their own little projects in their own little way, right, towards a large-scale systematic reconstruction. This also explains somewhat, while I'm here at NCAR, in that we put a lot of great thought into this great service, and we arranged to have, you know, web portals and online metadata registries and automatic systems for data transcription, but we didn't put any thought whatever in what we were going to do with the hundreds of millions of document images we were producing. So I rang up my friends at Sizzle and said, uh, can you help with this? And of course, NCAR is exactly the sort of place to run uh, a, a, a key archive uh, uh, for, for this sort of uh, recovery process. So we want to do more data recovery, like the observations I showed you from the Contiki, but we need to do it at a bigger scale. So I've been drawing inspiration from this man. right? If you've listened to a weather forecast, you'll know about the Beaufort scale of winds. It was popularized by then Rear Admiral Sir Francis Beaufort. Okay? When he wrote this letter, he was still a young man. Right? So there's a certain degree of insight into that. He said, at the time, early 19th century, the people with a lot of ships is the British Royal Navy. Okay? What better data could a patient meteorological philosopher desire? Well, I'm an impatient meteorological philosopher. <laughs> but I'm still, you know, keen on the general idea. You know, let's try and rescue some data from the, from the Royal Navy. Let's get out there and, uh, and, and work actively on that, right? So we need a slightly different time machine for this. On this particular occasion, we went into the UK National Archives. They're in Kew in southwest London. If you're ever visiting the area, you can visit the gardens nearby. Very nice. Pop into the archives and look at where all our weather information comes from. And if you ask them what they've got, they'll give you some rather unprepossessing looking documents. Right? This is a ship's logbook. Right? It's a logbook from the battle cruiser HMS Invincible. And this particular one dates from 1914. So the archives have been treasuring it for 100 years. I don't think it was a really great condition document, even when it was new. Okay? And it's starting to show its age. But it does have quite a lot of interesting data in it. So this is fundamentally the same thing I just showed you for the Contiki. Two pages of data, each page one day, midnight at the top, midnight at the bottom, noon in the middle. And you can see running across columns of data. And temperatures, pressures, wind speed and direction, absolutely fundamental to the information captured by these ships. Right? The Royal Navy may think of itself as a machine for you know, projecting power and waging war, but actually they're much more useful as a set of mobile observation platforms. And being you know, a very systematic and powerful organization, they're pretty good at it. They have good protocols for capturing and collecting data. And all their logbooks are archived very carefully in the National Archives. So this particular ship on this occasion, right? this is early in December 1914, was at Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands. Right? This is the entry at 4 AM. So I can tell you that at 4 AM on the 5th of December 1914, at Port Stanley in the Falklands, the wind was from the south southwest. It wasn't very strong, Beaufort Force 1. BC are Beaufort letters, and they tell us that actually there was a little bit of cloud in the sky. Definitely wasn't raining. We have a barometer, barometer height in inches of mercury and a barometer temperature, so we can adjust it. We have a wet and dry bulb temperature, and we know that they were cleaning the ship. Isn't that nice to know? Right? They spent a lot of time cleaning the ship. 
Sometimes they paint the ship, right? You do get the impression that you know they're not always that busy. But I chose this particular example because sometimes they are busy, and actually it turns out that these documents are episodically rather interesting, right? The archives keep these documents not because they have weather in them, but because they have history in them, because they are the official records of the action of a part of the British government. So this is the log page from three days later. This is the 8th of December, 1914. And if we start this information at 4 o'clock in the morning, we get our first weather observation. And they've stopped cleaning the ship because they're trying to disentangle a cable which has got caught around the propeller. Okay? But we still have our weather observation at 4 a.m. Now, ships operate on the watch system. So every four hours, they change the officer of the watch. They change all the crew. And we tend to get one observation every watch. So we get one at 4 a.m. I expect another at 8 a.m. But on this occasion, there isn't one. Right? And instead, there are comments in the log saying, sighted strange ships on horizon to southward. Right? So they've allowed themselves to get distracted. Right? It's possibly reasonable that they allowed themselves to get distracted because they were in the Falkland Islands chasing Count von Spee and his, uh, his uh, opposing set of ships, ships from the German Empire, and it is exactly that squadron that has appeared on the horizon to the southward of them. So this is a real-time, first-hand account of the Battle of the Falkland Islands, as seen by the Invincible. So we see the ship setting sail in pursuit of the German squadron. Okay. On this particular occasion, the British ships were bigger and faster than the German ships, so the Invincible was on the winning side in this battle, which is why we have her logbook. Right. And we can see that actually they end the battle at 7.30, having sunk most of the German squadron, going in to rescue them. But they were a little careless, no weather observations for this period. It wasn't until midnight of that day that their heart rate sank to the right level, and they started thinking, we've forgotten something. And they realized why they were really out there, and they started making weather observations again. So I like showing people this log page, because actually it gives you a real idea of what these documents are about. But it also tells you why we're interested in them. They've got a lot of weather data in. So we went into the National Archives and said, right, we're going to run a project. We want pretty much all the UK ship records. And we chose a period from 1913 to 1923, because the period around the First World War is very badly observed. I like Gil Compo's comment about it. He says, the period of reduced international cooperation which basically means people stop making weather observations and sharing them and putting them in the database and turn their activity to less productive pursuits. So, OK, this is a problem we have to fix. Okay. So we photographed 350,000 pages of logbook information, which turns out to be about this much, just to give you an idea. Right? And with the Contiki, we were able to send one researcher into the archives and say, photograph all these log pages for us, type in the numbers, please, we'll put them in. This process is not going to work here. Right. We're operating on a bigger scale. Right. There are millions of observations in these records, which is great, but we've got to get them off the page. So we didn't have any money, really. It's quite often the case. So we teamed up with some researchers and collaborators at the University of Oxford, actually in the astrophysics department. Okay. But they're not really astrophysicists. They're experts in what they call citizen science, in public participation in science. And we said, we looked at all the logbook pages we had and said, OK, some of these pages are quite interesting. Maybe we can ask people to help us read them and put in the numbers. So we put our 340,000 pages of documents on the web, and we built a user interface around them that basically said, come help with science. We'll show you a possibly interesting ship logbook page. Please type in all the weather information on it and the other information we need. And we set up this website. We called it Old Weather. Right? And uh, our colleagues at the University of Oxford built us a really nice user interface where basically it pops up a logbook page, right? And you draw boxes around the bits we're interested in, and we say, okay, what's the date of this page? Where is the ship? So this one's the 8th of June, it's at Hankow, right? And then another little box saying, please type in all the weather information. And it turned out this is quite popular. People like reading these logbooks, even the boring ones, right? So. This is um, an example output. This is the logbook of another battle cruiser. This is HMS New Zealand. Right? And what I'm showing you here are the data we've extracted from it. So every page, we've got three people to read each page. So we could do comparisons between the people, find out whether it's working or not, how accurate it is. 
and the little blobs on the page mark areas on the page where each person said there is interesting information here and the ones we're really keen on are the blue ones those are the weather observations on the right hand side there's the information extracted from this particular logbook and we've done this effectively for each of the 340,000 pages. We got at least three people to read each page. We extracted the information. And we have weather data. We have um, uh, dates. We have ship positions. Okay? And we also collected a bit of history. Right? It turns out this is not just a climate project. It's also a history project. We're extracting other information from those pages. So here's the results, basically. So this is the position of every Royal Navy ship in our database over the period of record. And early in 1914, the Royal Navy doesn't do much. Based on their logbooks, they drink a lot of gin, they play a bit of tennis, they hang around in port. And just as you're starting to think, why do we pay these people again? In August that year, everything changes. So the First World War was undoubtedly a bad thing. It had at least one good side effect in that it sent the Royal Navy all the way around the world. And so instead of sitting in Portsmouth and playing tennis, they went to interesting, far-fung places and measured and recorded the weather there for us. Right. So we're able to use this information to extract weather information for quite a wide section of the world. And if you're a naval historian, you can watch this and actually see the war develop. Right? I won't make you sit through the whole thing, but you know, you'll see the ships going round into China. At the end of the war, you'll see the, um, the, the Arctic convoys going round to Murmansk to support the white Russians. Naval historians love this reconstruction because they'd quite like to know where all the ships were as well. And until we did this project, they didn't know. Because to find that out, you'd have to read 340,000 pages of logbooks, which is hard. So we ran this as a citizen science project. We got a lot of volunteers to come and help. Right? And running citizen science projects, as I can tell you having run one, is, is extremely hard work, but remarkably rewarding. 16,400 people participated in the project. That's the number of people who typed in the numbers from at least one page for us. A hundred or so of them are really keen. Right? And one of the side things that we built on this project was a forum, a section where we encouraged the participants in the project to talk to one another, to put up postings, to, 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 to help you know, with the deciphering of difficult handwriting, to talk about the interesting things that they discovered in their logs, and also just to socialize a bit. And it turns out that this sort of project has very strong social benefits. And from this forum, I came to realize that actually there are a lot of interesting things going on in these logbooks that I would never have thought to look at if we were doing this project professionally. So I like this page. So this is the page from one of the smallest ships in the Royal Navy. This is the insect-class gunboat HMS Tarantula. The Navy is a great seamanship. They're not so great at classifications. They think the tarantula is an insect. And if we'd been digitizing these observations professionally, if I'd had any money and I'd been able to pay somebody to do it, we would never have looked at this page because it has no weather observations on it. But it is telling us something interesting. It's talking particularly, uh, this is a, a, a metadata page about the barometer, right? And there's a story going on here as to what's going on with this barometer. So this ship is actually halfway up the Yangtze River in the middle of China, and they've got suspicious about their barometric pressure measurements. Right? And it turns out they're justified in being suspicious. This is a small ship. It doesn't have any kind of meteorological specialist on board. And I like this because it illustrates both the strength and the weaknesses of the observations. These are not professional observations. They did not use professional quality instrumentation. They did not use professional staff to make the observations. And sometimes things went wrong. But it also says that they cared about the observations they were made. They noticed that their barometer was measuring incorrectly. They had a backup barometer, and they calibrated it. So if the, if the HMS Tarantula, an insect-class gunboat, can do this, right, many of the other ships can do it too. And it actually turns out that most of our observations, despite being made by amateurs, despite being transcribed by volunteers, are pretty good, well usable for our purposes. So the virtue of a citizen science project is you get many eyes to look at each page. So they see different things, things that I would never have thought to look at. And we can learn other things as well. Right? So what happened in 1918, apart from observing the weather? Well, there was a Spanish flu epidemic. And it turns out that most, but not all, of our logbooks have an entry, number of people on sick list. Right? 
So some of our volunteers decided that they were going to digitize this number and keep records for it, right? Nothing to do with me. It was an entirely volunteer-led project, right? This is the number of people on the sick list of the battleship HMS Africa, right? No prizes for guessing when the Spanish flu hit this vessel, right? right. Several dozen of them died. No records in the logs, right? This is a big ship. It was a King George-class battleship, one of the biggest ships in the UK fleet. Had more than 700 crew. But there was a period of about a week where more than half of them were dangerously ill. And the thing that really impresses me about this is we read the logbook of the page throughout this period, and pretty much the only reference to the fact that more than half of the crew were dangerously ill was the number on the sick list and occasional records of casualties. They carried on operating the ship perfectly normally, as far as I can see. They were sailing northwards up the east coast of Africa. They carried on making weather observations. We still have our seven weather observations every day, and they appear to be just as accurate as before. So kudos to the Navy. You know, in the face of adversity, they carry on just nicely. So we've got lots of good weather. We've got some other interesting science that we'd never have thought of. But if you turn 16,400 people loose and turn them into a community based around a particular set of documents, it turns out that they go off in all sorts of interesting directions. So we also got art. Right? This is HMS Argonaut, as interpreted in the style of the Beatles' Yellow Submarine video. Right? This was made by Caro, one of our principal volunteers. Okay. We also have poetry. Right? Kathy Wendelkowski was reading the logbook of HMS Mantua. She was horrified to discover that they had accidentally dropped their entire ration of chocolate overboard. <laughs> but my favorite section of the forum, my favorite you know, non-science output from all this work, right, was a, a forum thread where the, the participants were discussing why they were addicted to the project, what it had done to their lives. You know, sitting there where they were saying they, they, they told their cats to patrol as requisite you know, when they let them out at night. You know, how the, the vocabulary of the logbooks had, had uh, invaded their own vocabulary. And this is my single favorite forum entry. Right. So we do science fundamentally because we want to change the world, because we want to make a, an impact on people, to improve their lives in some way. And I suspect, like most of you, I trained as a mathematician, and my ambition is to build better products and better projections of the future. But maybe we could think a little more broadly about you know, how we're helping people and what we're actually doing to them. Does it work? Well, yes, it does work. So we took these data. We rescued 7 million observations from these pages. And fortunately, the 20th century reanalysis team reran the reanalysis at about this point. So I have one version of the 20th century reanalysis, version 2, without all our observations in, and another version, version 2C, with our new observations in. This is for one particular point in time. So this is just a picture of a storm. So effectively, all I'm doing here is making a contour plot of mean sea level pressure, as reconstructed by 20CR. The reanalysis is an ensemble product, so it makes 56 different reconstructions. So this is 56 contour plots of the pressure all piled on top of one another. Right. And the virtue of doing this is you can see the precision of the reconstruction. Right? If we have lots of observations and the reconstruction is very precise, all 56 contour plots line up very nicely and it looks sharp. Right? If we have few observations and the reconstruction is very uncertain, all the contour plots are in different places and it just looks like a pile of spaghetti. Right? So what you can see fairly clear here is adding all those observations in the North Sea right, has sharpened our reconstruction of this storm. The, 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 the central low is deeper, so we're, we're, we're reconstructing the storm better, and it's a much sharper reconstruction. The uncertainty has reduced substantially. And as I said, there are a dozen or so new observations, so this is maybe 20 of the 7 million reconstructions have gone into this particular reconstruction. We have similar improvements many different times, many different corners of the world. So, this worked relatively well, we thought. We were pleased with it. So my colleague, Ed Hawkins, said, right, we need to do more of this. I'm going to do land station observations. Enough of these ships. Okay, there are other things out there. Okay. And I was very skeptical about this, because I believed that our work on the ships had worked, because the ships were actually, at least episodically, quite interesting. The logbooks only contain weather as a side effect. They're mostly telling the story of the ship, so volunteers will enjoy reading them. If we try and rescue weather station observations, the weather observations are not only the main point of the, of, the, of the documents, they're the only thing in them. So 
So this is a set of weather station observations. This is from the UK Daily Weather Reports. And again, this is a document from an archive. This one comes from the, um, the UK Meteorological Archives. It's straight out of Great Moor House. Right? And there is nothing in here at all except weather. Right? I think this document is too boring. And I told Ed that I thought it was too boring to sustain a citizen science project. You know, you can't get a 1,000 volunteers to be interested in reading this stuff. I was, I'm glad to tell you, entirely wrong about this. So Ed went ahead and did it anyway. And it turns out that people were very happy to participate. You know, participating in the process of science is a valuable activity in itself. Right? And we successfully got 10 years of this document, 50 stations, two observations a day, all around the UK, reconstructed. Right? This project is called Weather Rescue. Right? It's still actually running today. So if you're bored with this talk, fire up your laptop and go to weatherrescue.org. Right? Or maybe tweet, you know, go to weatherrescue.org, contribute to science. Okay? Encourage you know, all your friends who are a bit bored. This is a great thing to participate in. We're still running this today. It's still rescuing observations. Okay? We put them all online. Everything's on GitHub nowadays. At least I try and put everything on GitHub. If you want the observations, they are here. They're available for use. Okay? We put them together in a system, and once again, they'll go into future versions of the reanalysis. We've actually done scout runs of the reanalysis with these observations in. So this did leave us, however, with a little bit of a knock-on problem. We're generating new observations relatively fast, right? So I remember sitting in a cafe with Gil Compo, head of the 20th century reanalysis team, explaining to him that we were now generating lots of re-observations, and we needed him and his team to rerun the 20th century reanalysis very often. You know, every month or so, we had another you know, few thousand observations, and we could do with another reanalysis run for, for a week or so. Uh, he was not keen on this idea at all. Right? And his response to this was to tell me that I could do data assimilation myself. Data assimilation is easy, he said. It's just linear regression. I, I was a little doubtful about this expression, but actually, it's not as hard as you think. You know? So if you haven't tried it, I recommend looking at it, particularly the ensemble Kalman filter. It pretty much is just linear regression. Okay. <coughs> So one of the things that I did, working again with, with Ed Hawkins, is to say, OK, you know, we can't rerun the reanalyses anything like often enough. Right? It's just too much work to rerun a reanalysis. So instead, we have to estimate what would happen if we did rerun the reanalysis. So we have our own statistical offline data assimilation scheme, where instead of running the reanalysis, we take the old reanalysis, which gives us our, our covariances, we put our new observations in, we use those covariances, our new observations, and we would say, what would our reconstruction look like if we put our new observations in? So there are 44 new stations from the UK weather reconstructions in this particular case. On the left-hand side, we have a spaghetti contour plot of the 20th century reanalysis, version 3, 80 reconstructions. Okay? Each pale blue line is a contour from one reconstruction. The dark black lines are the mean of the 80 ensemble members. I've only plotted them in areas where the uncertainty of the mean is, is, is reasonable. Left-hand side, version 3. Right-hand side, version 3, with our statistical offline assimilation process used. <coughs> and the right-hand side, right-hand column, is a leave one out cross-validation. So at each weather station, essentially, I've said, what's in version 3? Those are the blue dots. What would be in a new reconstruction with the statistical assimilation if we left that station out and just used the other stations? They're the red dots. And every now and then, you'll see black lines appear. Those are the observations. So we can check that it's working. <coughs> and you can see, actually, that this, this is working. We're making very big improvements on the precision of our reconstructions. And this is particularly important for things like storms. Right? We've now reached the point where, having rescued these observations, at least over the UK, right, we can reconstruct the weather, particularly for severe events, with much greater accuracy than we did before. Right? So we're reaching the point, because of this data rescue, because we have the statistical offline assimilation system, that we can actually start to use this thing to study severe weather events explicitly. So this is great. Okay? We know where we can get our observations from. We have a process in citizen science for extracting them from original documents, turning them into observations. Because we're working with the Copernicus project, we now have a system for putting them into central databases and actually using them. 
and we have a statistical approximate assimilation process, and eventually we add them into the real uh, reanalyses and generate new products. Tremendous. And I was very happy with all this process until I started doing some sums about its efficiency. So we're still running citizen science data rescue, rescue projects, right? But I just thought I'd make a list. These are all the big data rescue projects that I've been associated with over the last few years, right? So we've got the number of observations rescued, and we've rescued 12 million observations, which is tremendous, right? The number of document pages we had to photograph and read to do that, a million document pages. But critically on the right, as an estimate of how long it took, right? And it hasn't taken 30 years elapsed time, thank you, because we ran these things more or less in parallel, but it has taken more than 10 years elapsed time. And whilst this is great, it's not great enough, right? There are hundreds of millions of observations out there. There are tens of millions at least of pages that we need to read, right? And we, we haven't got 300 years to wait. I'm not planning to live that long, and even if I were, we need the answer sooner than that. You know, in 300 years in the future, climate change will have happened, right? So whilst this process works really well, it is not fast enough, right? And at the moment, I'm very focused on saying, OK, we need to do this faster. So how do you go faster? If you've been reading the press recently, right, you probably can't escape from all these little articles warning us about the rise of the robots and how they're going to take our jobs and take over from us. I'm very encouraged by this. I want a robot to take over my job. More precisely, if I can recruit a few hundred robots, you know, they'll probably be cheaper than people. Maybe they'll be faster than people. Maybe we can speed this up by the order of magnitude or more that we need to do this. Right. Well, we, we, well, there are actually people attempting to get robots to make poetry, but I reckon that's not quite within in, in my remit. Okay. So at the moment, the robots are no good. Right? If you feed a document image like the ones I showed you into an optical character recognition system, right? It, you know, you get something, but it isn't any good. But they're getting better very fast. And I'm particularly taken with a, a, a new Amazon product, which they call Textract, okay, which was launched officially a couple of months back. Right? And I ran this product on a few of our sample documents. Right? So this is a set of observations that we've already extracted. Right? We've got volunteers to do them. Right? So I know the answer. So I can run this thing through Amazon Textract and say, compare this number with the volunteer calculated number that I already know. Is it right? So green squares are where Textract got the right answer. The solid pink squares are where Textract got the wrong answer. And the dashed red regions are where Textract didn't think there was an answer to be had. They just missed the number altogether. Right? So I'm somewhat encouraged by this, because this is about 90% successful. Right? However, this is our easiest document. So I've been talking to Amazon, right? And we're pushing this forward. You know, I've given them some sample pages. Can we make this system better? But if any of you or anyone you know is a computer vision machine learning specialist, I'm keen to talk to you. I have a problem that needs solving. And I think that's the area in which we're actually going to really need to work. So just to remind you, this is the game we're in. We need better services, better products. We're looking to extract information from the archives make a better job of it. We're collecting document images really fast. This process has got to work very substantially at scale. Right? And what we're doing now is actually we're developing this process to try and make this run faster and more efficiently to get the sort of products like Haddist with more power and precision. That's really all I have for you. I thought I'd finish by showing this is my favorite uh, data set video. This is HADFUT4. These are monthly mean uh, surface temperatures. So the thing to look out for is all the gray areas where there are no numbers. That's the area where this really needs to be improved. And I also want to say thank you to all the participants in this project. One of the difficulties of working on something like this is I have thousands and thousands of people to thank. And this isn't an Oscars ceremony, so I'm not going to go through everybody's names. But I owe particular gratitude to the 20th century reanalysis team, to Kevin Wood and the old weather team, Ed Hawkins and the weather rescue team, and actually also to, to Sizzle and the people at NCAR who've been working essentially in parallel to the work at the Met Office on this project for a long time. So thanks again, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions?